Now, Chef, you went from Noma, uh, you know, being like a superstar chef and doing all these amazing things, and now you're here back in the United States and you're working on the brigade and you know helping the school out. What made you want to do this? Like, what got you thinking about this in the first place? Yeah, I think um, you know one thing I'll say is that when I got into cooking, or interested in cooking, I was like 15, and when I got into cooking, I didn't know any famous chefs. Of any famous chefs, I didn't know any names. I didn't know any famous restaurants that had nothing to do with why I got into cooking. Um, I got into cooking because I come from a big Italian family, and we have those stereotypical big meals where you sit down for hours and you eat food, and you eat more food than you should eat, and then still not enough food. Someone wants to give you more food, so on. Um, um, but then when I got to culinary school, when you get into the scheme of things, and if you're ambitious and you work hard, you're pressured into fine dining. Because that's the that's where you that's success in the food business. That's what's considered successful, which is wrong. It's just the way people think about it, though. So it took me until I got to Noma, and to have a job where uh, would allow me to do anything I wanted afterwards, to have the confidence to just say like, this isn't even why I cook. I'm not cooking for fine dining. I don't want to. This isn't this isn't making me happy to wake up run around and shout at people in this environment to cook for 45 people on a daily basis. So I started to think about, I wanted to, the idea that of cooking for as many people as possible. Waking up every day and thinking that, okay, you cook for 45 people, or waking up every day and saying that, okay, what we did today prepared food for millions of people. That's exciting to me. And you're not only preparing food for millions of people, but you're doing it on a daily basis again, so it really affects their life. Because again, we can sit here and talk about food, food, and you know, the, the menus and all these things, but in a big thing, in a big way, when you cook for people every day of their life, I mean, think about that. If you go to a school, you're in school for like 14, 15 years, or really longer than that, and you eat every day, five days a week, and these people are feeding you, that's a huge responsibility. And even going beyond the food itself, the way the experience is, the way you sit down, that is shaping the way you look at food. Now, all of you have chosen to kind of learn a little bit more about food. So maybe you know, you know, you know different stuff and you appreciate it more. But if you don't think about food like that, then all you know about food, most of the kids in this district, all they know about food is what they get in, in, in schools. And if that's not good, we're teaching them the wrong thing. It's basically like teaching, teaching kids the wrong history, just like making up history, just teaching that to kids. That's kind of what they're doing. So the idea, of being able to come into a school, change the food, and essentially affect the way a whole generation of people eats and thinks about food is pretty powerful. So I, it was an easy decision, and when I said I was gonna do it, a lot of schools approached. A lot of schools were like, hey, we want you to come here, and, and, and generally the superintendent here, he was the one who just said, like, let's do it. It was kind of like, whatever it costs, whatever, whatever we have to do to make it work, let's make it work, because it's not about changing school food as much as it is that school food is an essential part of education. A lot of people take school food and put it out on this thing and say, like, school food, let's change it, let's make it better. But if you really think about it, it's just part of the education. So you, could, you, you think about curriculum and all these things all day long, but nobody's thinking about school food itself and actually making that better and how that contributes to education. So that's a big thing. So when we talk about the, the, the big picture of, of this whole program, the big picture of what we're doing goes far beyond the food. It's about taking care of students. It's about education. It's about pushing people forward in the right direction. And food's a part of that, no matter if you think about it or not. I mean, when you're in culinary arts, Again, you think about food in a certain way, but food's a very powerful thing, and you have a real opportunity when you're able to cook, especially now because there are so many problems uh, surrounding, again, obesity, nutrition, or for that matter, food security, where people don't even have enough food. It takes people who have an understanding of how to cook, how to handle food, how to save food, how to utilize food, all these things to be able to fix those problems. And I'm seeing now, as I've gotten into this, that a lot, a lot of young chefs are coming out of culinary school and this generation is more concerned about these, these topics than before. And they're, they're, they're calling me and saying, hey, how can we get involved in this? And that's really encouraging because it's, it's the idea of being able, getting into a career where you can help rather than just to, you know, just, just do whatever. So it's, it's very interesting. One, one initiative we have is we'll be meeting with 
some of the culinary schools like Johnson and Wales, the bigger culinary schools, to try to create a program where you can go to culinary school and then maybe the last three months of culinary school you veer off and you start to understand what it is to cook food to, to follow these guidelines because you'll never learn this. Nobody ever teaches you this. When you go to culinary school, they teach you about fine dining. They teach you how to cook food that's generally unhealthy and they teach you how to, teach, to, to cook food that usually costs a lot of money. No one teaches you how to make a meal for $1.30 or a meal that's really healthy for you. That's something that's generally not taught to professional chefs, which seems kind of crazy. So, yeah. Um, kind of maybe thought on school food is or opinion or view, it can be specific foods, it can just be in general, it can be experiences that you've had that have either been positive or negative, but I'd like to hear from you. I don't want to talk for four hours straight because then it'd just be entirely bored for me. So um, so I don't know if anyone has any opinions. Someone can start it off. There you go. Perfect. Right there. Well, sometimes in the school lunches and Let's say like in middle schools usually, right? They just serve prepackaged foods that wouldn't really be healthy, mm -hmm. but they say it's healthy. Right. Well, let me tell you this because this is a bit of a misconception as well. This is something a lot of people say to me. Oh, it's so great! You're making the food more nutritious. Well, quite frankly, the food that they were serving here last year was just as nutritious as the food we were serving here. So you can't mix up processed foods just because it's processed with the fact that it's not nutritious. In most cases, a lot of those pre-processed foods, I mean, they have to meet very specific guidelines. Um, to be a part of the, the school lunch, the National School Lunch Program, the food has to adhere to certain guidelines, and they're very strict as it is. So this might sound funny, but from the beginning, my goal was never about nutrition because if you adhere to those guidelines, it's strict, it's there. That's actually the problem, is when you go, the conversation about school food is always just about nutrition. But again, anyone who is, who is cooking in the National School Lunch Program, which is like 99% of schools, they're all at the same level as far as nutrition goes. And most people would actually argue that they're too strict. There's a lot of organizations out there that think these guidelines are too strict and make it impossible to actually make food that tastes good. And that's my focus. To, you have this food that fits under the nutritional guidelines, but it's not nutritious if nobody eats it. You know, we are in a school here where this school is community eligible, which means that we, every single student in this school district eats for free because of the income level. So you have kids that don't eat much outside of school, and these kids are choosing not to eat much because it's just not, they don't like it. And that's not now, but that's a problem. So again, our goal, so again, with the processed food thing, it might look bad, it might not look natural, it's probably not. Um, there are some kind of interesting ingredients in some of these foods, but at a very base level, the nutrition level is actually similar to scratch cooked food. But unfortunately, it's just not the same. It's a very different thing, and it doesn't taste very good. My biggest problem with the uh, school food isn't you know, the nutrition or portion, but the price. I think most schools overcharge for what they give, and I feel like that's a bit unfair. I mean, I know everyone has to make a profit, but, you know. What's, what, what price are you referring to? Like, what, do you give me an example of a price um, that, you, that you pay for a school meal, or you see charge for a school meal? Well, let's, my school makes a parfait for a dollar and 75 cents. Now, it's a bit bigger than this, and it's a decent size, but all it is is yogurt that we get, and you get some of the granola, and that's fruit. Um, Oh no. That's all it is in the parfait. You don't get anything else. You don't get anything else. What is that served as? It can be served as a side or it can be served as a part. How much is lunch? Lunch is usually $3.00. Is it $25.00? It's $3.25. Really? Yeah. Unless you're a teacher and you pay $4.50 for it. Okay. And they don't have any, um, they have to take off all the components. So, um, so, so you're paying. So let me get this straight. You're paying three dollars. Students pay three dollars and twenty-five cents, and you are participating in the National School Lunch Program in the sense that you have to take three of the five components. Yes. So someone's monitoring that. Yes. Okay. Which unfortunately um, lends itself to a lot of unopened milk and uh, unopened juices sure. and, uh, and whole fruit. fruit. Yeah. 
ending up in the garbage. Right. We'll talk more about that as well because we've changed some things to alleviate that problem. But I would agree. That's actually very expensive. In most cases, school lunch is expensive, but the economics, the way it works is, I mean, the national, the, the reimbursement rate for a lunch right now from the federal government. So if you, as a school, serve a lunch that qualifies as a reimbursable meal, which means they've taken all these three components, uh, it's about $3.18. So your school gets $3.18 um, when they're serving a meal. It's free when it's paid. So you guys are paying for a meal. They give you a small chunk of change. Um, it's like 25 cents. But it's strange that they would charge you $3.25 because usually what happens is they charge you less than the reimbursement rate. And the whole point of the reimbursement rate is it, it boosts it up a little bit to take you where you need to be. So that is how the price goes up. No? What is the least favorite thing you have and why? I'm curious. So you don't like that? Well, we really have a multitude of stuff. So uh, it's kind of hard to list like, what's the best and what's the worst thing. Okay. But, you, but generally, though, what are the kind of things that you see that concern you? Because you, know? you don't seem to be tremendously thrilled about it. So if you're not thrilled about it, why aren't you? You know, you have to be able to identify, you know, but maybe you are. If you're really, if you're really into it, then that's, that's good. That's a positive thing. But are there things that, because that's what we're going to talk about today, generally things that you can improve, things that you can change for the better. So you have to identify first maybe some things that you don't necessarily like. What did you, what kind of um, trays do you know? Plastic trays? Styrofoam trays? Styrofoam now, but we just use um, plastic plates. So why do you think you use styrofoam trays? And what do you think about that? It's 2016. How many kids go to school every day? About 800. 800. <laughs> what do you know about styrofoam? It's not good, right? It's not good for the environment. So that was that's something very common now. I don't know how that happened, but it's very common. It was happening here as well. Um, last year, every school was serving food on styrofoam trays, and I was like blown away by that. So, wow. So why are we using styrofoam trays, especially when a lot of these kitchens have? $25,000 dishwashers that are essentially beautiful conveyor belt dishwashers where you can put trays through and it's easy. But it's a labor thing. It's a labor thing from all standpoints and that's another big piece of this puzzle that people are going to tell you there's not enough money to do all this stuff to make things happen. It's not even just a labor thing to wash them but who, you know, where do they go? So when you're finished eating in your cafeteria now, where does everything go? Everything probably goes in the same trash can. Is there any separation of anything? We do have a recycling bin, but that's mostly for the bottles. Right. So that's something that we're working on now. This is an initiative that we've just started is separating food waste versus other waste and then getting better recycling. But it is kind of crazy to think in a school of all places where you're educating people, you're educating young people how to not just learn but move forward in life that we're not teaching people how to recycle properly. We're not teaching people kind of to take care of the environment. So, yeah, the idea, but it's easy to put everything in one trash can. Just think how much that cuts down on labor costs, custodians, everything else. Like if you start splitting out the food and you have, so for example, we started serving on plastic plates. We did that this year. So we have plates, we have trays. So last year, everything went into one bin and that was it. Call it a day, it gets thrown out. Boom. Now we have three types of plates. You have a regular plate, you have a soup bowl, you have a smaller plate for size, for trays. And we're separating food waste. So now when, when someone comes up after they eat, there has to be a pot of trays, a pot of three types of plates. Food waste goes in one place, regular waste goes in the other place. You can only imagine it creates a headache. It creates a headache not only in the cafeteria, but also in the school, in the kitchen where they're washing dishes, because now they're washing a lot of stuff. In high school, we have over a thousand kids. That's a thousand trays. That's 3,000 plates that they're washing every day. So the labor just skyrockets. But you would agree that it's a much nicer experience to eat off of a plate versus eating off of a styrofoam tray. And I don't even tell you guys, but these are the little things that really change everything. It's not just about food, it's everything. You know, what does your cafeteria look like in your high school? Our cafeteria in our high school is pretty drab, I'll say that. And we're working on figuring a way what we're not working on what we're doing. But that's a big part of it as well. You know, are there windows? Can you see the light? How's the lighting in the cafeteria? Is it clean? What color is the paint? What does the floor look like? 
These are things like when they think they're not, they make a huge difference in the way you feel when you go to the cafeteria. You know, you want to go to, is it super loud when you're in the cafeteria, like really loud? Because some cafeterias, the way the acoustics are, like crazy, it's just like, you know, the best not. design kitchen we have in the whole school district. Because that's another thing, when you see like school kitchens, you sit down in the cafeteria, you walk into the, the kitchen and you walk back out. So you have 22 minutes to eat or 20 minutes to eat like you guys have, and the flow of everything is designed so poorly. So in this kitchen, the kids actually come from a different place from back from the from behind and they actually go down two lines. The kitchen's in the middle as you can see, so there's a line here, a line there. They never come in and out, they just come straight, straight through, which makes it super efficient, super fast. Um, well, I don't want to say super fast because they are smaller kids and they're just generally a bit slower to go through the line. It's kind of dependent on how quickly they move. But nonetheless, it works really well for us. But as you can see, like it's funny because the, the older kitchens that you'll see across the country are usually the ones that are the most well equipped and the largest. This is a big kitchen. There's a lot you can do out of this kitchen. One of the big initiatives we have for our program is by putting a chef in a kitchen. When it's not busy in this kitchen, we use it to produce food for the community, to generate revenue for what we're doing in here. Because it's costing us more money to, to have a chef in the kitchen. So for example, at one o'clock, I don't know what happens in your school kitchen. Does anything happen in your school kitchen after the school food's made? No, but in our restaurant, we'll, we'll sell strombolis, quiche. Right, but you guys do it. Right. You have a kitchen that's dedicated it, to school food. Sometimes they'll do that, like on a half day, they'll sell brownies in the hallway. Right. But that's it. Nothing but it's generally that. pretty quiet. I imagine most times the majority of staff is gone. And that's everywhere in the country. It's just how it works. So the idea is having you're having this large space that goes to waste. So you have a large space, you keep the chefs, you keep the cooks, you keep the chefs, and they produce food. And it can be utilized and then go back to the program. So that's one thing we're trying to do here. Uh, but little things like, again, very simple. This is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Wrapping it in deli paper, parchment paper and deli paper. It seems like a simple thing, but it's nicer than wrapping it in like cling film. When you get a sandwich that's just like completely wrapped in cling film, it's not very nice. So again, little simple things are so important. We've, we've gotten away, you guys have salad bars. So we used to have salad, but most people look at salad bars like the kind of bench, like, oh, we have a salad bar. We found a lot of the students were not happy with the salad bar from a funny standpoint that they thought they were unhygienic because a lot of students were rounded, touching things, um, maybe, you know, like how fresh were things in the salad bar and so on. So we did away with the salad bars and we do composed salads now. So you'll see today. We started with offering two composed salads, uh, but now we just do one because it didn't seem to make sense to offer two. But it's got a specific dressing, specific garnish. It's easy to go, you know, it's to go. It's ready. Oh, thank you, Tina. That's Tina. <laughs> but it, we feel it makes a lot more sense. We also are offering soup now. I feel like soup is a nice thing to offer, especially as, as the weather gets cold. Offering nice hot food, um, particularly a soup. But again, you have to look differently at the younger grades, so we're going to start to go into the elementary school now. We probably won't be able to offer soup. It's one of those things that these kids can't even barely hold a tray properly. They're always dropping trays on the ground. Um, so giving them a bowl of hot soup is probably not a good idea. They probably won't be serving soup much longer once the first uh, first grader burns him or herself on a bowl of hot soup. Um, other things that we're contemplating, like utensils, things like this. I mean, it all contributes to the experience in a positive way. I mean, even these things, like this is what we have now, but like, they don't even work properly. And like, when kids are like, stressed out about getting a spoon and it like shoots all, this is all stuff that contributes to like a not, kind of a very chaotic experience that we're trying to get away from. Um, the water dispensers go here, milk here. It's a very simple streamlined operation. Uh, but other than that, you know, I just wanted to just show you the kitchen. We haven't done too much to it outside of a little bit of color. This is pretty much how it was, which again is a pretty good kitchen. Um, I don't know how many school kitchens you've seen. I don't know what the school kitchen looks like where you guys are. I've seen some school kitchens that were essentially uh, a 10 by 10 box with a desk with a computer on it and an oven. And that's the school kitchen. So uh, we're very fortunate here. So to say that this is how all school kitchens look is not right. I don't know, is your school kitchen decent size or? Fast. It is big. Yeah. Really? 
So that's great. So you have, I mean. It is too, until you work in it because when you leave the slotted spoon, it's. Well, it's not set up. It's not set up to cook. Well, that's why it's important to keep our stuff completely with the gas. It doesn't have So that one spoon can be miles as you add up those spoons every it's hard. I mean, honestly, this kitchen was not, like, cooking in this kitchen for the first time, it wasn't set up to cook. It wasn't set up to, like, go here and get a pan out and start cooking. Now we feel like we're getting into that point, but it takes time. It takes time. It's trying to be as accommodating as possible, patient, understanding, listen. Because also, these are people who have been doing this for a long time. And they have experience doing this. They're about different food, but they have experience doing it. They have experience working with kids. And it's a matter of us kind of listening to each other, which has been a big part of the model is just kind of working together. For sure. Cool. So we'll continue back on this one. Right. So you, you, there's positive and negative things, you know. For them, yes, there's generally more work. It's a lot more work. But most of them were working part-time. And now they're all working full-time. They wanted to work full-time. Now they can work full-time. So that's a, that's a positive thing. I mean, there's a lot of things that come out of it. And it's just a matter of listening to them as well. What do you, what do you want to wear? What uniforms do you want to wear? And then do it. You know, so we just ordered new uniforms that we're going to change that they're they're happy with. You know, like what can you do to make people happy? It's so important. One design for younger students and one design for older. Yeah, that's it. That's a great suggestion. I think that's something that we want to we want to get better at. I think there's a lot of everything you serve, you can contemplate and say maybe this. For example, you could serve uh, a whole thing of grapes to. You know, a high school kid, but maybe if you cut the grapes, I know it might sound crazy, maybe if you cut the grapes for a little kid, it's better. About 20? It's about 17. 17. So I mean, if we could break up in groups of four and then one group left five. Um, I want you guys to just come up with a meal, just one lunch, okay? Um, I'm going to give you a piece of paper and a pen. And I, but I want you to think about all these things we talked about. One other thing that we haven't mentioned is culture and how your culture might play into uh, the meals you serve. We are in a, we have a, a large Hispanic population in this community, so we're often trying to solicit recipes from people we work with in the kitchens, or students even, or students' families, to better understand how we can integrate some of those recipes, because why not, why wouldn't you? Because you know there's so much tradition rooted in culture when it comes to food that if we can incorporate it into what we're doing, it makes plenty of sense. Not to mention, if you can get a really good recipe, um, and incorporate the food, you're probably going to make a lot of people happy. So um, we're trying to do that as well. That's also something to consider. I don't know if where you guys go to school there's particularly you know certain things, but just a, there's a lot of reasons why you want to serve certain types of food, which mean mean something. I think it doesn't matter if it's in a restaurant or if it's in a school. If you're going to serve a meal, there should be a reason for serving certain things, whether it's because it's seasonal because it makes sense in your community, maybe there's something that you know people generally like to eat in your community. There should always be a reason. It doesn't need to be the most crazy reason, but you should always think about why you serve certain things. Or I know everyone loves this, and if I cut it this way, it's really nice, and people are gonna enjoy it. But there's just always something to think about. So if you guys wanna just pass these out, these are just basic, these are the basic National School Lunch Program guidelines. You don't have to follow these for your little exercise now. But what I want you to do, again, it's come up with a meal that contains a protein, a grain, which the grain has to be at least, if it's say a baked good, if you were gonna make a biscuit, it would have to at least be 51% or more whole grain flour. But So your grain could be brown rice, it could be quinoa, it could be a biscuit, it could be a scone, uh, but it has to have whole grain, just keep that in mind. It could be tortillas, but they have to either be corn tortillas. Corn tortillas actually qualify as a whole grain or they have to be flour tortillas with wheat flour. Um, so a protein, a whole grain, a fruit, a vegetable, and then the milk, obviously we don't have to worry about the milk, but it has to contain all those components. So if we can break up into teams of four, again, three groups, three groups of four, one group of five, we'll put together a meal. I have pens, we'll write down this meal, and then we're gonna share these meals and understand why we need certain things. So one of you, so I have one of you each group is meant to speak out. I know that's, that's asking a lot. Yeah, well, my group came up with um, chicken parm for our know, protein. Okay. For our grain, we have a pasta and a red sauce. Our veggie is a side of butternut squash. Our dairy, obviously milk. And our fruit, we came up with a fruit salad with a sweet dressing. Nice. Sounds great. 
there's one thing we started, we did uh, we did chicken parmesan sandwiches last well this month last week. One thing about chicken parmesan can't do that would be traditional is you can't fry the chicken parmesan. So you have to bake it. You can bake it. What we did was um, <coughs> I mean we kind of deviated from what tradition would be, but we did it. We did chicken thigh, boneless chicken thigh with tomato sauce, provolone cheese, and then we made like this seasoned breadcrumb mixture, like coarser breadcrumb, and put it like healthy amounts on top. Um, so it wasn't fried, but it still has that same kind of effect. It was very popular. That was our that was our attempt to wean people off the chicken patty, the chicken parmesan sandwich. But it actually went very well. So that's fun. that sounds great. That's definitely something kids would like for sure. Good. Did you bread the thigh or did you leave it? Um, no, so it's not breaded. It's just roasted, and then again we have this like crumb topping on top, which I think gives it the effect that that is desirable. It's very well seasoned garlic and, and herbs. And like One thing you find that's very hard to do in food, in school food, because of the budget, is fresh herbs. We can use fresh herbs, but when you use them, it has to be like very, like last, like just a little bit at the end. You don't have, there's not enough money to say like marinate a piece of chicken in, you know, chopped herbs. Like that, there's just not, there's not enough money. Unless you've got it growing in your courtyard. Well, that's the other thing. If you're growing them, then you obviously can, then you can, that's a very good point. So we use it more than I ever had in my life with a lot of dried spices and dried herbs, which are very good as well. That's great. Who's next? <laughs> Apparently you are. <laughs> yeah. So we decided on doing a shepherd's pie. Okay, cool. Nice. And it's going to have a pie crust, potatoes obviously, corn, ground beef, and then a side of sautéed green beans and a fruit salad. Nice. Now we would say like, uh, we get a lot of requests actually, I think they served Shepherd's Pie last year, and they actually made it, it was like one of the few things they made, we get a lot of requests for Shepherd's Pie. I would say that, you know, you set aside green beans, but I would even really say like, you can have all the vegetables inside, you have like one, one shot thing, but right. it's inside. <laughs> no, I mean, either way it's fine, but I just think, when you talk about these meals from a labor standpoint, if you can hit all aspects in like one component and it's like solid, like if you could bake that shepherd's pie like something nice and it's like one really nice thing and everything's inside of it, it's nice and hot, that's great. And you're not like, it's easy labor wise, it's like a win-win, you know, you build this all in advance, you bake them, you serve them, it's easy service. Because service is super hard, it's challenging. Like we talked about when you only have 22 minutes or 20 minutes to serve lunch or eat lunch. If you can literally take a shepherd's pie that's cooked, hot, delicious, seasoned, prepared, and just put it on a plate or put it on a tray, go. That's a lot easier than even little things like we've determined that if you have three components that have to be put on a plate, that's like pushing it to get the food out fast enough. Like if it's three separate things that have to go on a plate and then served, and you're trying to do that, for example, like in high school, again, the waves, the lunch waves are about 300 kids each. You're trying to get through 300 kids, and they can serve 300 kids in like 70 minutes in high school. They've gotten down that fast, which is amazing. And that, yeah. That's where these students come in and play with our student lunch. Um, they can't put our <coughs> service out without at least eight of our students assisting in. Wow, so they have a lot of serving. people. How many people they have? Well, they have they have four in the kitchen staff, and then they have as many as eight students. They have four in the kitchen staff. Yeah. That's it. And how many kids do you have school? 800? No. Sweet. One less. Oh, well. And there's nine. 800 students? There's 600. Yes. Five and change. So you see downstairs, we have about 600 students in that school that we were just in. They have nine people working in the kitchen. They had eight people working in the kitchen before we even made the change. That's because they have the um, luxury of having students there ready to help them. So I'm just gonna say it again. I find it, you know, in this, in this by no means, I don't say this in any way, but just thinking out loud, the economics of it. I mean, I'm just curious because the price which is being charged for meals is high, mm -hmm. and the labor is very low. I'm just curious. It's it's interesting. So we're doing the fettuccine with rice, protein, salami, and sauteed chicken, veggies, uh, broccoli, and cauliflower. And fruit, we have mixed fruit, salad, sliced, 
grape and apples, and apples, strawberries, grapes, and pineapple. Yes. And for our drinks, we have iced tea, a smoothie, can be fruit or veggie smoothie. Nice. And I'm not sure. Nice. That's great. I mean, I think smoothies are great. We're, we're looking to figure out how we can serve smoothies and breakfast items now. Just a matter of doing them and making them cost effective breakfast. We don't get much money to do it. But that iced tea, I think, is great too. That's a great option. It's cheap and it's tasty and it's something different. It's not water, it's not milk. As we talked about before, the idea of eating a savory meal and drinking milk is kind of funny. You know, you drink iced tea, eat it, you know. That makes a huge difference. I think if we served iced tea, it would be like crazy. We wouldn't be able to keep up with the amount of iced tea we need to make. That's very good. That sounds great. Veggie smoothie, too. Huh? It's ambitious. They've done them here, they've done kale smoothies. Um, that they, I mean, obviously, there's the fruits in them, it's not just kale. Um, but yeah, the students really respond well to them. They're not super cheap, so it's figuring out how to. I would, I would love to serve smoothies for breakfast as like an all encompassing, like a smoothie, smoothie with yogurt in it. Um, as like just like that's a one shot breakfast. We started doing, we just started touching the breakfast now. The breakfast until now has been in the elementary school, is just a cereal kit. Um, in the high school, we just started doing last week breakfast sandwiches to make breakfast sandwiches, makes, makes biscuits, sausage patty. Makes like a frittata of egg, cheese, and wraps them. And they did breakfast burritos yesterday. They made them from scratch, and they're super successful. It's easy. It's like you know, you pick it up. You don't have much time. It's hot. It's nice. That's the thing. I think I like temperature of food as well. When it's cold like this outside, and you come into school, and then you eat cereal, cold milk. You know, I ate cereal as a kid a lot, but when you come into school and you can get something that hot. Makes a big difference. You feel good. You know, you feel like it's nourishing, especially at seven in the morning. It's freezing. You want something hot? I don't know. That's just maybe that's just me. But I mean, even if it was a hot drink, I don't know what that could be. I mean, you probably could do a hot cider. Yeah, hot cider would be good. But that would be nice, though, right? I mean, you love hot cider. I mean, think of how that changes your mood. Instead of like coming in and eating a thing of cereal, I don't know, just think. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. We had um, rosemary lemon grilled chicken. Nice. It has that protein with the grains being garlic bread. Okay, nice. And for fruits, we did um, fruit kebabs with like okay. candle, pineapple, strawberries, watermelon, things like that. Nice. Vegetables, garlic, and herb roasted potatoes. And then for our dairy, we had um, milk. And then for a drink, we could have um, just lemon water. Nice. That's great. That's great. That's really good. I think. It seems like most of you are leaning towards the when it comes to fruit, mixed fruit, um, which I find interesting. I don't know if this is the way I think, but a lot of the fruit we serve, when we do like the prepared fruit, I don't like them to stick to like a singular fruit. But I think we find that most, which again is most important, that most students want just mixed fruit, like a fruit salad. I guess it's this thing of like being very um, deliberate, very intentional. Like it's not just any fruit mixed together, but it's like, these particular fruit, like we talk about combinations, like certain things go well together. Certain, but again, I think with fruit, it seems like most people enjoy a nice mix of fruit. It's um, interesting. Making fried fish, that probably kids would see the texture and like. It's funny you ask that because I think you, you're probably right. Now we can't physically fry things, but we could do like a baked version of like something breaded. Yeah. And it's funny you say that because I think. I think that would be very successful. The fish you'll have today is sold with a crust on top of it, but even that, it's it's a nice chunk of fish. Like, I mean, it's a big, solid piece of fish that we could offer. But I think we've seen some of these like completely breaded, battered, baked things, and I think students would definitely go to that quicker. I think you're right. I think it's, it's, it's a good point. So that's something we need to decide. So many of them were raised on fish sticks. You know, it's, right. it's part of their, their comfort food as children, right. you know, younger children. Um, have you thought of offering fish as one of the alternatives and then um, and keep the competition kind of stiff between the other offerings to entice people to go on to the other yeah, side? Yeah, so what we, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So what we do, as we start offering one main entree, and then we offer the composed salad, 
We were doing sandwiches and soups as an option, soup and sandwich, which we took away because we found that the kids who wanted sandwiches were just the kids who wanted like PBJ. And now we started doing tuna sandwich because the kids asked for tuna sandwich. But we were doing like we did roasted turkey with cranberry sauce and mayonnaise flavored like stuffing, and, and the kids were like, no, like the kids who want sandwiches like they wanted like peanut butter and jelly. So we were making all these sandwiches every day. We did a, we did a sandwich. We were making hummus and all different types of roasted vegetables. It was delicious. It was delicious for us. It wasn't delicious. So that was like a soup and sandwich thing. So the sand, like so the options now we've talked about it with fish when we serve fish to serve another main entree to see where that goes. Um, I'm interested to I'm interested to see how it will go today. We only served fish twice. This will be the third time we served it. Um, the first time very positive. The second time not as positive. But it was also served in kind of close proximity, so I think it had something to do with that. Because the kids who eat it love it. And that's the thing that keeps me on it. They don't like it, but it's just a lot of kids won't try it, which is strange. Um, we don't really have that problem with any other dish we serve, so. But we're actually going to go down there now. What you're seeing right now is what the kids um, see every day when they go through the line. So we just did 200 kids in here. Um, and the choice every day is going to be either the hot entree or. Yeah, a choice of sandwich or a proposed salad. They do not need to be They also offer soup every day, um, a prepared fruit and a whole fruit every day, and then a side salad. Um, today we're also offering a dinner roll that came from New London Bakery, and then you have milk, and at the end we also offer water. So come through, um, take anything you like, uh, you know, try everything, try whatever you want. Uh, today we're serving baked sole, which is New England sole. It has a Ritz cracker and garlic aioli on top, and that comes with a brown rice pilaf and garlic green cheese. So that's their hot option today. And then on sandwiches, we have a turkey sandwich, a tuna sandwich, and a peanut butter and jelly. We have a corn chowder, and then we have a Southwest chicken salad. Okay. You guys go ahead and help yourself. separately like in little cups before they go in here um, but there's water at the bottom and this pump just um, irrigates the whole thing we have lights on during the day when we're here and we turn them off at night but uh, we started with and these just went up last week so they're not really they haven't done anything yet um, but they are staying alive and they look healthy so that's a good sign the ones in the high school are a little more mature and they have some lettuce so it's kind of cool um, but the thought behind this is that we can plant things here that we can, you know, if we want to use, we can use. Um, if we want to do a taste test in the cafeteria, which we do pretty often now, we can feature those items. Um, and these little guys right here actually come out of here. You can take them and put them on the table or like take them to the classroom. So I told you guys I had, a, there were a couple kids in here yesterday who actually planted these two. <coughs> so they, they wanted to, you know, see how it works. So hopefully these will get big and they say the cabbage is fine, like you can grow a whole cabbage there and it's not going to fall off, so it's I'm awesome. interested to see that one. I didn't, I didn't think it would be that strong, but so hopefully in a couple months. I How think much does can... something like this cost? Um, a couple thousand, at least a thousand. Can you get the grant for it? I'm, sh I'm sure. There are so many grants, especially for like this. I'm sure they can. And quite honestly, they may have. I don't So what do you sprout from? Um, actually, in the food service office, we actually have a director of um, nutrition and agriculture, I think is her title. Um, but she originally came from Food Corps, and she was one of the Food Corps members for two years. And then they hired her on this year full time. And so this is kind of one of her projects, and she sprouts in her office. So we go up there, she always has like, sprouts or something she grew in her garden. So, very cool. Is there, is there a name for, for this? These are called zip gardens. Huh. Yeah. Zip gardens? Yeah. I'm sure you can go online and buy one for your house if you, if you really wanted to. Is there anything that this do, does for the plants besides, obviously, saving space? No, I mean, um, we do add plant nutrients in here. So, um, 
if, as long as you're using, you know, organic soil to sprout your plants, this can be a completely organic uh, vegetable, which ours are. But other than that, I don't think it's necessarily. Obviously, it's a more controlled environment, so you don't have to worry about the weather and wind, rain, and all that. Um, so they will be probably more sturdy than a plant outside, but specifically, no. I think it's more for the aesthetics and for the teaching aspect than anything else. Is it easy to use? Um, will dirt get on the floor? Or? Well, once you get it on the wall, it's easy to use. The hard part was, I guess, uh, getting it measured correctly and getting it mounted so it would stay there. Um, but I think once you figure that out, yeah, it's easy to use. Because I didn't actually plant these, so I couldn't exactly... I would take one apart and show you if I knew how to do it, but I don't want to break it. Um, but yeah, she's, you know, they're saying that once you finally figure out how to set it up, fairly easy to maintain. Yeah. You guys do any gardening? No. Yeah? I don't I don't, so I, I could kill anything, so that's why I'm all, I'm in here every day like, oh it's still alive, you know. Um, but we are gonna put a garden out in that courtyard across the cafeteria, so you guys um, I'll probably maybe I'll contact you guys once we get stuff planted and once we have something to look at, but um, I'm gonna use mainly student volunteers to plant that. Uh, there are a lot of kids here interested in gardening and agriculture and stuff, so it should be interesting. Maybe they'll teach me something. I don't know. Finishing thoughts on things. The one thing I wanted to mention, and this is so important, and this is also why I think a lot of chefs don't get involved in, in this work, particularly because, for example, we just started this two months ago. Um, this is like a whole other way to cook, a whole other way to think of things. If I told you that I'm completely happy with where we're at now, or should I say, we are where I want to be moving forward, I can close way far away from it. So the challenging thing is to be able to start on this and knowing that where you want to go is here, and that's just going to take a long time. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of chefs who wouldn't be, they wouldn't accept to be to do something like, for example, okay, so you guys just ate this lunch. Now I can tell you there's a few things about the lunch already that I'm I'm not super happy with, and I know what our limitations are. But I know also what we're serving day to day right now is literally a hundred times better than what it was last year. But it's still hard. It's an ego thing as a chef. You, a lot of chefs have egos, and you can you won't you won't allow yourself to do certain things. And there's actually been a lot of chefs who have talked about doing this kind of stuff. But ultimately, ne never get into it or never get into it to scale, meaning they never try to go many places. They'll focus on one school for 20 years and just make food really good for a group, of, you know, a small group of students. But again, I guess the lesson is here is that you can't, you can't let that get in your way. It's easy, like this kind of work, to have like an ego and be like, oh, I'm this person and I do this. And But you need to understand that sometimes, like in this case, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken. And it's all not going to happen at once. You can't be afraid to get into it. And you can't be embarrassed. You can't be, you have to just get into it and start going with it. So, you know, as much as I think we have so far to go with what we're doing here, I'm very proud of where we're at. And you just need to be able to, you need to be a kind of person that's not too concerned about what other people think and, and things like that. You just need to, you need to know your course and where you're trying to go and not worry about what other people think. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, one other thing I want to touch on as I was talking to Barbara is that the importance of, <clears throat> and this goes, I mean, this goes very, very far beyond just cooking, or, uh, but the importance of being a good person. Uh, what we've done here and what we're trying to do here is so much to do with people skills. And whether you think about it or not, like working in a kitchen or working in a restaurant or working in the hospitality industry in any shape or form, I mean, now I'm understanding, because I don't understand the full scope of your program, I just understand that you guys are, some of you are spending all four years, or you're all spending four years in culinary arts. I mean, you're committing, you're committing your life to this in a big way. And one skill that's so important, and I know for me it's helped me out tremendously in my career, is the personal aspect of things. You know, it's very easy to work in a kitchen and not say good morning, not say good night, not say hello, not look people in the eye. I mean, when I worked at Noma, we were 45 chefs. Half the time, people would just call each other chef, 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 chef. Nobody knew, 
because we would have the people working there work for free, and they would come and go every three months from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Nobody would even take the time to learn people's names. So you have all these people running around, and nobody knows each other's names. Oh shit, it's miserable. It's miserable. Working in a restaurant could be amazing, or working in a hospitality in a church in San General can be amazing, or it could be absolutely terrible. <coughs> it can be. That's the realistic uh, kind of thing about working in a restaurant, or again, hospitality. It can be terrible. But you can make it a place where it's amazing because working, if you like to cook, and usually surrounded by tons of energy, a lot of you probably like that. That's probably why you're doing what you're doing because you'd rather not sit in the office, but you'd rather be out there doing things, action, this and that. But you have to be positive when you do it, otherwise it's just it's miserable. Also, too, it wears on you. I couldn't tell you how many chefs that I know. I mean, I'm 32 years old. How many chefs that I know that by my age, they're done. I would actually say most of the kids I went to culinary school don't even, they don't even work in the restaurant industry anymore. They just left. Because it's, because it's hard. But it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, it's hard work. But it's, it takes the people in a certain environment to make it a nice place to be. Again, being considerate, being thoughtful with each other is so important. And also, too, it will allow you to be successful. That's what's going to allow you to be a leader in a kitchen. If you're just a jerk all the time to everybody around you, best chef ever. You've got something coming to you because there's always going to be a better chef than you. And quite honestly, food is, is, is completely opinionated anyway. You know, food that you make that you think is great and other people think is great, other people might think is terrible. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. So it's always about being a bigger person. It's always about being patient with people, learning from people, teaching people. If you know something, you should teach people around you. Take the time to teach, teach the people around you. I'm just saying it because unfortunately in our business, in our industry, it's a huge problem. It's not professional. You know, most kitchens are run like pirate ships. You can say and do whatever you want. I, I'll be very honest with you. Things that I, when I was at Noma, I had kids coming from all over the world to work for free. And they, people would do whatever you wanted them to do without saying, you, running, running to do things, working all kinds of hours. And I could say whatever I wanted, however I wanted to say it, whenever I wanted to say it. Nobody ever questioned that. And that's not the right way to work. That's not professionalism. That's not managing people. That's not taking care of people. That's not, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes the higher you go, the easier it is to do that. Because everybody wants to work in that big time restaurant, the big name, and then that's just how it is in a restaurant. That's, some young chefs think that they only want to be a part of that because that's like the cool thing to do. You know, get a few tattoos on your forearms, wear tight jeans, wear black shoes, run around, scream at people, get screamed at, and that's like the cool, trendy way to be a chef. It's not. So the Gordon Ramsays aren't helping us much, are they? No, this isn't about that. This is about food. This is about taking care of people, feeding people. It's about arts, you know, making something beautiful. But you can't, it, it doesn't need to be that way. And I'm saying it because I, 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 I can't stress it enough. It's a huge problem. And a lot of the big chefs, and when I was in Copenhagen, we said, we try to get better at it, but it's almost like there's a lot of young chefs who look for this, that like, that's like desirable for them to be a part of this environment where it's just like cutthroat, like throwing people under the bus left and right whenever you can, like nothing matters, it's not about working as a team. And I'm just saying that it's quite the opposite and you should never get into that because again, once you get to a certain point, if all of you pursue this as a career, you might get to a point where it seems like that's just how it is. That's how it has to be. That's, and I'm telling you from being in a place where it was the top, it doesn't have to be that way. That's not like what, what's required to be successful to move forward in this business. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of you will go work in places where it's introduced to you that that's, that's how it works. That's how you become successful in this business. So suck it up. <laughs> so I'm telling you, it's not that way. In fact, it's the opposite. And the more considerate you can be, the more thoughtful you can be, the more smart you can be, clever, intelligent, work together as a team, that's the more successful you're gonna be. You'll be leaders before you know it. It's a very antiquated industry. Things that are happening in kitchens now were happening 40 years ago. I feel like that's not how most businesses operate. Most businesses that move forward, they progress because they had to, usually because of laws. You just can't do certain things. And in kitchens, for whatever reason, a lot of people get away with a lot of things that they shouldn't be able to. You know, whether it's forms of harassment, abuse, whatever it may be, it's not okay. It's not okay at all for a second. You know, and working in a place like a school, which is interesting, it forces you to be the utmost professional because you're dealing with students, you're dealing with administration, you're also in a very sensitive environment where, of 
course you can't do many things, but that's it's it's a much more professional way of working, and it's a great way to be. So I just think you can never underestimate how important those skills are. Middle things again, like I said, saying good morning to people, saying hello to people. It's a depressing environment to be in when you work all day and you forget if you said if like where you're at. Like, did I say hello to you today? I don't even know. When the days start to blend together. You're not even sure if you said hi to someone, if that was the day before, if it's the same day. That's not a positive thing. You know, you get, you get these like days of just working. That's not why you guys probably got into this or what you're doing now. Trust me, you don't want to be a part of that. So it's just a little thing to touch on. Or ideas um, or suggestions or thoughts on the day. Did you learn anything? Did you see anything? Did you, is something strange to you? Did you learn something that's kind of shocking to you or see something? Um. Why did you choose Brigade? Um, As the name? Yeah, to play on the word. You know. um, yeah, so Brigade, spelled A-D-E at the end, is really like the singular term that refers to a group of chefs. There's no other, when people refer to a kitchen brigade, which is a traditional organization of the kitchen, French terms. It's not really used often, but that's kind of the reason. Then obviously ending in A-I-D in the sense of helping out, helping, so a group of chefs, a group of chefs helping, and that's kind of the model it's not like a big business structured model, it's just a group of chefs. And I think the way I think of it is just getting as many people involved, learning how to cook this type of food. And also, again, being these type of people that are very patient and caring and thoughtful that can go into these types of environments, whether it be a school, whether it be a hospital, and, and make change. Because actually to go into these types of environments to make change, you have to be that way. You can't just, you're not gonna go into a school and say, this is terrible, you need to fix it. Then they're gonna tell you to go away. You know, you need to go in and be patient and listen, understand the problem, understand why things are the way they are, and then you know, 